You know it's a ten dollar fine for jaywalking in right, Los Angeles. Shut up. What I want to know is, are you working on anything having to do with Jonathan Mardukas? Never heard of him. Well, I believe you have heard of him. Well, let me tell you something, asshole. I've been working on this Jimmy Serrano thing for about six years. Mardukas is my shot. I'm going to bring him into federal court. And I don't want any third-rate rent or thug who couldn't cut it as a cop from Chicago bringing him to L.A. on some bullshit local charge. Do I make myself understand? Can I ask you something? These sunglasses, they're really nice. Are they government issued, or do all you guys go, like, to the same store again? Do I make myself understood? Chris Kelzer here with Matt Howell. And on this episode of The First Run, Matt, it's Monster Week. Prepare to battle or simply just survive. Our triumvirate of monster films. First up, Matt, it's going to be Psycho Goreman, a film that has the, how does it go? The bacony stink of Canada all over it. As a ruthless alien badass comes under the thrall of an entirely too bossy tween. Then the power couple of Mila Jovovich and Paul W. Sanderson return with another video game adaptation. This time, we're going to try it with Monster Hunter. And of course, we got Tony John in this one as well, as well as Surfer Ron Perlman. Then our last stop on our monster tour brings us to the post-apocalyptic Earth as we join a young man on a quest to see his true love and all the wacky hijinks and terrifying creatures he meets along the way. Love and monsters. It'll be the absolutely gorgeous rundown of the big release on physical media featuring your straight-to-DVD and streaming picks of the week. And then finally, Matt, they've made the Oscar announcements. We're going to kind of give our quick thoughts on them. We're not going to do our predictions until we get later to the, a little closer to the show, but... What's up, Delroy? Let's we'll start everything off, though, with a clip from Psycho Gourmet. Oh, my God. Man, that's what this one called me. Uh, Are you also man? You are much smaller creatures. No matter. You will suffer like the rest. Know that in the sweet release of death, you will be spared the sight of your planet being torn to pieces. Watching as everyone you hold dear is drowned in a sea of their own blood. Shut up! No, I am not a man. I am a wall man. And you're gonna let go of my stupid wiener bro right now! Mimi, look! Is this yours? Me? The gem of Paraxidite. This cannot be. Believe it, Buster. Stop messing around and explain, scum. Yes, yeah, scum. Matt, why don't you go ahead? Stop messing around and explain. What is PG or Psycho Goreman all about? So. The planet of Gygax, um, which I'm assuming is a shout out to Gary Gygax. There was basically a war many millennia ago where they defeated the great evil and buried him underground, which turns out to be the back, a backyard on Earth. Um, a pair of uh, a brother and sister team, um, while playing a, an insane ball game, kind of reminiscent of Calvin Ball, find the the sarcophagus, somehow manage to open it and gain control of a essentially all powerful magic evil being with the the control of a a, a gem that they find along with it and um it goes about how, how you can expect with uh, some maladjusted uh, canadian youth there you go so matt comedy and horror combos are a tough thing to pull off so mm-hmm. how does psycho gorman do psycho gorman is pretty interesting there are my emotions or my my willingness to go along with this thing kept swinging from one extreme to the other i think Sometimes it's a little hokey and it doesn't work for me. Other times I was really on board with this and I was having a good old time. And I think overall there's more instances of having a good time than there were of of some of the hokiness of it. Um, So overall I thought it was pretty successful. 
Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. I had a lot, a lot of fun with it, man. And it's one of the weirder, more tonally destroying films I think I've ever seen. I mean, a lot of times we'll applaud a film if it's able to balance certain tones and themes when it tries to tackle a couple different genres or things at once. Mm -hmm. And this one just kind of takes a sledgehammer to it, right? There's this family dynamic. There's this potential touching relationship that develops between our our kids and the unstoppable monster. And <laughs> uh, it's weird and odd and exceptionally gory at times. Very, very funny at some moments. And then some of the hokey, more corny stuff doesn't always land as well as well as I think it could. But mm-hmm. some of the odd stuff I enjoyed, particularly the relationship and the character of the dad, Greg, it's just mm-hmm. a, that whole family dynamic is just odd. And I enjoy watching them all interact with each other. But it's it's just weird. Absolutely bizarre film that never kind of stopped being entertaining for me. Yeah, I... It's weird. I mean, I think you're right. It is a very strange film. It has a very unusual sensibility. Like they, these, these characters own what's essentially sub build as this, this all powerful ultimate evil that cannot be stopped. That if he loses, if they lose control for just a second, he's going to not only kill everyone on earth, but on in the universe. And it's played for laughs. Like he's this, this evil, you know, soulless thing that is, uh, tortures people and it doesn't seem to bother the kids at all that you know that this thing is going to kill everybody and is it seems to be as, as long as they're okay they're they're fine turning their best friend into a giant brain um doesn't seem to bother anybody even yeah. the brain's parents weirdly enough um, so uh yeah it's it's got a very odd sensibility that you have to be kind of just go with and i will say i feel like psycho gorman's design himself is like somebody found the Jeepers Creepers costume on like a Hollywood backlot somewhere off of yeah. eBay, and they used it to uh, to create their monster. That's fair. And I kind of, the whole thing while I'm watching this thing, at, at times it felt like a classic episode of Star Trek, but like everybody is just tripping balls the entire time while they're trying <laughs> to come up with a plot for this episode, right? right? That's kind of the right. feel it had to me. And it's enjoyable. It's weird, but it's fun. There's a lot of odd stuff, like things that don't work or make sense that are matched together. Like the coda of the film, when we see the council of all the aliens, and they're yeah. deciding basically what they're going to do. And we basically have right. like one option, and one of them pulls out a revolver, so they start killing right. themselves. I mean, it's just like weird stuff like that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And then the other thing, too, you mentioned the kids. I think if I had any critique that out of all the mishmash that, didn't, that I've was able to excuse. I kept getting hung up on Mimi's dialogue being entirely too old and sophisticated for a kid her age. Right. I don't know what that is that just kept every time she would say something like this, like the kid wouldn't react like that. The kid wouldn't, a kid wouldn't say that. But meanwhile, I have all this other insanity happening around me, which I'm, you know, (laughs) I'm all in for. Well, I think because Mimi is essentially the, the main character and she is, a complete solo sociopath. I mean, right. she has, she, yeah, I mean, she's barely self-contained. And if, if Psycho Gorman had not shown up, I mean, she would be like a Bond villain. She would be Kristen Wiig from, you know, Barb and Star is basically what she would turn into. Um, Fair. Again, that's just one of those things you got to go with. I mean, it's, I think it's okay not to like Mimi that much because Fair. I didn't really like Mimi that much, but even though she's the protagonist um, for the most part, but, you know, I guess it's about the, the love and the bond that's developed between soulless evil and a uh, sociopathic little girl. And that's what they were going for. And they succeeded. You know, I believed it by the end. Yeah, I agree. And it's, it's kind of like a combination of like ET, you know, or like a super eight where we have this family dynamic dealing Mm -hmm. with this alien visitor, trying to figure out kind of what to do. But the focus is still, I guess, mostly on the relationship between this family, but it's just the hyper crazy spoofed version of that kind of, trope right. in these science fiction horror films and it's a blast so man uh psycho gorman is currently available to rent pretty much on all your digital platforms i think the blu-ray right. may be available now and if you buy okay. it directly from the company they have a hunky boy edition that comes <laughs> with, that, that comes with like trading cards and some other bonus features i think particularly two extra dvd or dvd how old am i two extra audio commentaries so you can get exclusively right. from them at a reasonable price so you may want to track that down. I ended up giving Psycho Gorman a B. I just went with it. 
Yeah. Um, I went with the B minus. Um, I think, uh, there were some parts that it brought it down a bit of a, a half a step for me, but I, I, I enjoyed it overall. And I would say that this is a shutter film. So obviously it will be hitting the service probably in the very near future. If you want to hold out for that. Ah, there you go. I don't do it. Flip them some money. It's like six, seven bucks to rent. So why don't you go ahead and kick it to them, right? <laughs> it's Canada. What are you going to do? We've got a chance to see Psycho Gorman. Shoot us an email at feedback at thefirstrun.com. Matt, we got three movies to get to this week. So let's keep rolling and let's hear a clip from the next one. My friend tells me I misjudged you. That I might even owe you an apology. Just don't hold your breath. Why did you put me in chains? What are you so afraid of? Your world. And what it could do to mine. You weren't the first to cross over from your world. There were others. A long time ago. That's how you speak my language. Hmm. I made a study of it. What happened to me? How did I get here? I believe that the answers we both seek lie here. At the peak of that mountain lies the Sky Tower. Remnants of an ancient civilization. Very advanced. Very dangerous. It is said that the ancients knew how to travel between both worlds. I believe that is the purpose of the Sky Tower. That is what brought you here. Wow. Matt Monster Hunter. So, I'm not familiar with this property. From I understand, it's based on a video game. Mm-hmm. But Mila Jovovich is, what, platoon, whatever? I'm not sure what the numbers are based on what you're... <laughs> what you call it in regards to the military. <laughs> but her and her buddies, a bunch of soldiers, go out, Matt, into the desert to find a missing group of, of soldiers. And they get sucked into this weird cloud portal thing that brings them to a new world that is just filled with these different types of monsters. And we have Mila Jovovich and her husband, Paul W.S. Anderson, reunited. Of course, they've known mostly for what? The Resident Evil films, I guess, is the biggest thing that they've done together. And I think right. they, I think he directed like three or four of them. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. I've actually started to rewatch those for some reason. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know why you would, but I'm halfway through the second one again, and it's not good. It's not good. <laughs> so, Monster Hunter, how does this one turn out, Matt? I've heard this is supposed to be a lot of fun if you turn your brain off. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Um, I think I was kind of on board with the ridiculousness of it for the first maybe 15 minutes of it. Mm-hmm. I think that the opening of it was pretty fun. But when it becomes this kind of fish out of water, kind of these two people that don't share a language kind of talking to each other and trying to get along, I think it really loses a lot of steam. Um, it picks up a little bit when um, – Ron Perlman as the shaved Wookiee shows up with that hairdo that he's got going on. But it's, I don't know, overall, I thought it was, it started off promising, but it ended up kind of dull for me. It really, I could, it really couldn't keep my interest with all of its frenetic things going on. I agree entirely. I mean, outside of maybe surfer Ron Perlman, who looks like a gigantic troll doll. Uh, <laughs> there, it's, there's really not much. And I got to tell you, Unbearded Perlman, shaved Ron Perlman, permit? Not for me. No. Not my thing. I don't know what yeah. it is. I, just, I think it's not helped by that hair, though. Like that, like, yeah, I, yeah God. The, the, he looks like a troll doll, is pretty, like a blonde surfer dude troll doll, is what he looks like. <laughs> I love Perlman. I think he elevates everything that he's in. But right. uh, this is just, I'm not, I don't know. I mean, is it the best Anderson film I've seen? Probably. And they uh, they had some interesting things. Like I said, the opening of the film is fun. I enjoyed kind of the steampunk aesthetic of this world that exists, though it's not used that much. And there are some fun visuals with it, though they're, they kind of lean in a little too much on certain effects, particularly the car roll, uh, which happens four times that they're in a mm-hmm. tank or some type of vehicle right. that does right. a roll and everybody's like moving around inside it. Like it's four yeah, or five with- times. I know. With and one of those people, the main character is standing in a to- a hole in the top, mounting a machine gun. Um, she would have been dead after the first roll. <laughs> she would have fallen out and been crushed by the Humvee. So I like some of the creature designs. Anything involving any kind of weird spiders is going to freak me out. So you'll get a mm-hmm. thumbs up from me with those. 
And uh, it has a relentlessness to it in regards to the monster attacks that was reminiscent to me of Starship Troopers, but of course not half as fun. It also Mm. has a corniness too that Starship Troopers has. But again, I don't feel like it's intentional in this one so much like it was with that film. It's certainly not as much fun. And the whole film for me ended up being more just kind of a slog. There's just not enough action set pieces here, or at least the quality of them is not enough to overcome just this poorly written film, these air quotes performances, and (laughs) this paper thin plot that exists basically just to set up a sequel. Yeah. I mean, especially the way this film ends, it was infuriating. And I almost, I said out loud, no, no. (laughs) And we don't get enough Surfer Ron. We don't get enough Surfer Ron. We don't. So I don't know what you're thinking. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it is a video game franchise and I've never played it, but I now understand this is like a, it's one of the PlayStation's bigger franchises, especially in Japan. And it's really more about, there's no real story, essentially. You're basically running around this alien world, killing monsters and getting loot. This is basically the whole game. So it's a weird one to build off of. I would say this is not my favorite Anderson film um, because he also did direct the 1995 Mortal Kombat movie uh that introduced mortal Kombat to the world as far as in movie form and uh, he also exactly and he also directed the oh, event horizon better than it has to be event horizon yes you're right yes that yeah. is still his best film you're entirely right about that mm-hmm. i've just so been, I've, it's it's like that film has been jettisoned from his over in my mind because right. it's so much better i think than anything else he's done since then well it's not a video I mean, game movie yeah, we're, I mean, we're approaching. It's like we're at Yui Bowl territory, I think, for half of his output. Unfortunately, right, right, yeah. As far as the ensemble, as much as it is, I mean, Mila Jovovich and Tony Ja are asked to do all the heavy lifting in this film, and just by the simple fact that they don't speak the same language, it doesn't really work all out that well. Mm-hmm. It's not that uh, entertaining, to be quite honest with you. It's it's unfortunate, but it's okay for the first like fifteen minutes or so, um, and then maybe the the last. It's the last climactic battle are kind of fun. So not the worst thing I've ever seen. Um, still probably better than the Resident Evil films, but uh, that might be damning it with fate praise. So what are you going to give it? Um, I'm going to give it a C. Okay. I went C minus. Okay. So we're pretty close as usual. So if you've had <laughs> a chance to see Monster Hunter, why don't you go ahead and shoot us an email at feedback at the first run.com. Again, this one is available for purchase on your physical medias and to rent on all your digital outlets as well. All right, let's take a break, man, and talk about what's coming up on Physical Media this upcoming Tuesday. I'm here to tell you about the 11 men who lived. Who survived that fire. The 11 men who fought back against their deadly fate. Yes, yes. God, I told you to read from the Iraq, man. Well, see, Mr. Farley, I was wondering if folks might prefer some storytelling from places outside of Iraq. Just for tonight, Mr. Farley. I think you ought to read from the Iraq all the same, Captain. Sort of thing these people expect to hear. How about we vote on it? How about we go? Mr. Farley's E-Rath Journal. Yeah. I can keep on with the story of the men of Kill Rock. Yeah. That is a clip from News of the World, the latest team up of Paul Greengrass and Tom Hanks. Previously, they did that I Am the Captain Now movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. That's how it's known, colloquially, Captain Phillips. Oh. This time, they team up where Cruz, Cruz, Hanks is a Civil War veteran who agrees to deliver a girl taken by the Kiwa people years ago to her aunt and uncle against her will. They travel hundreds of miles and face grave dangers as they search for a place that either can call home. It includes feature commentary by Greengrass, some deleted scenes, and making of featurettes. I actually saw this in the theater, Matt, and thought it was okay. It was all right. Yeah, you, uh, I was tr- going to try and catch it, and you were like, mm. I wouldn't risk going out in the Rona for that one. So I, I did not. I, I took your took your advice. I Yeah, I hold by that. If, if you want to rent it or check it out when it hits your HBO Maxes or whatever, sure. But there, unfortunately, there was really not very much unique or interesting about this film, unfortunately. 
But one of Matt's favorite films of 2020, Soul, is getting its physical media release. Best Buy is putting out a steelbook. Target has a digipack. It's a story of a musician who has lost his passion for music and he's transported out of his body and must find a way back with the help of an infant soul learning about herself. Five deleted scenes, audio commentary, and as usual, Pixar does a bunch of great stuff with regards to its special features. So you're going to be picking up Soul, Matt, or since you got Disney Plus, what's the point? Yeah, I'll probably keep it. I probably won't get it um, because we do have Disney Plus. But I guess if we ever drop that, um, it would definitely be worth picking up. There you go. If the price is right. There you are. Breaking news in Yuba County. Featuring Juliet Lewis, Mila Kunis, Allison Janney, Jimmy Simpson, Aquafina, and Ellen Barkin. A woman catches her husband in bed with another woman, causing him to die of a heart attack. She buries his body and takes advantage of the growing celebrity status that comes from having a missing husband. However, she soon finds herself in over her head, dodging cops and criminals, all while trying to hide the truth. Julia Ormond returns in Reunion. A pregnant woman returns to a recently deceased grandparent's old family home to spend time with her estranged mother. What begins as a tenuous reunion slowly turns terrifying. New to Blu-ray, Criterion is releasing The World of Wong Kar Wai, which includes As Tears Go By, Days of Being Wild, Chunking Express, Fallen Angels, Happy Together, In the Mood for Love, and 2046. New brand new 4K restorations of Chunking Express, Fallen Angels, Happy Together, In the Mood for Love, and 2046 approved by Wong Kar Wai with 5.1 surround DTS HD master audio tracks. And then we do get 4K restorations of the other films, but those are in uh, uncompressed mono oral soundtracks. New program in which Wong answers questions submitted at the invitation of the director by authors Andre Eichmann, Jonathan Lethern, Sofia Coppola, Ryan Johnson, Lisa Joy, and Chloe Zhao, as long as others. Alternate versions of Days of Being Wild featuring different edits of the film's prologue and final scenes on home video for the first time. A 2000 short film by Wong, an extended version of The Hand, a 2004 short film available in the U.S. for the first time. I mean, this thing is loaded. we got three making of documentaries, an episode of television he did. If you're a Wong Kar Wai fan, this is the set for you. Uh, it includes deluxe packaging and a perfectly bound French fold book featuring lavish photography, an essay, and more. Um, I, I may pick this up, Matt, when that next sale rolls around, 50% off. I'm probably going to be mm-hmm. all over this. I own Chunking Express and in, in the mood for love, but um, maybe I'll just sell those bad bears or who knows and then uh, pick this up because that thing looks gorgeous. Speaking of Event Horizon, Scream Factory is releasing its version of it, but the brand new 4K restoration of the original camera negative and then a whole bunch of new interviews, like 10 of them, with different cast and crew members. One of the big things they were trying to do, I guess, is there was a, a harder version of this film originally shot, Matt, that had a lot more violence and gore in it. Mm. And those elements are just gone. They, I guess, Scream Factory searched far and wide for them and were unavailable to find them. And then it has all the um, archived features included as well. Audio commentaries, five-part documentary in the making of the film, deleted and extended scenes, and more. Raw is being released by Scream Factory as well. Matt, a film we both enjoyed, which is that French cannibal film. It includes the audio commentary with the writer-director. Uh, discussion as well with the writer-director. And let's see here. It's some deleted scenes and other stuff too. But Raw is really good. If you have a chance to see it and you love horror, you will not be disappointed by Raw. Arrow is releasing The Bloodhound. A visit to a wealthy and reclusive friend lends a young man in a world of fear and despair. Featuring audio commentary by the director and editor, as well as four experimental short films by director Patrick Picard and more. Vinegar Syndrome is releasing a batch of films, including Rush Week with a brand new 2K restoration, Last Gasp with a 4K restoration, Death Promise gets a 2K restoration, and then Jungle Trap. No big restorations on that one, it appears. Kino is releasing Cross Swords. An adaptation of The Prince and the Pauper, the brand new 4K restoration from the original camera negative, as well as a new audio commentary, as well as Shootout and Doc. Doc is uh, Shootouts with Gregory Peck. Doc is with Stacey Keach and Faye Dunaway. You have a 2K restoration of Doc. And The Kaiser of California, Matt, is an interesting film. It's the uh, one of the two films made in Nazi Germany in 1936. Hmm. It's a Western shot in uh, Sedona, the Grand Canyon, and Death Valley in California. So, uh, Interesting. Yeah, I had no idea that, uh, that the Nazis shot a film in the United States in the uh, mid-30s. Yeah, that's crazy. But there you go. 
and then Code Red is releasing Schoolgirls in Chains, which I'm sure is fun family entertainment, also known as Come Play With Us, Girls in Chains, or Let's Play Dead. Two deranged brothers who are under the domineering influence of their crazed mother kidnap young girls and keep them captive in chains in their basement, where they're subject to some depraved games, in air quotes, that often end in torture and murder. A brand new 2K restoration completed in 2017, three separate audio commentaries, and more. Paramount is releasing a Best Pictures Essentials on Blu-ray. For 80 bucks, Matt, you get Wings from 1987, My Fair Lady, The Godfather, Terms of Endearment, Forrest Gump, The English Patient, Titanic, American Beauty, Gladiator, and No Country for Old Men in one set. So if you don't have any wow. of those, it may be worth picking up. There is a 40th anniversary steelbook of Friday the 13th Part 2. And coming out with 4K releases, uh, Godzilla. This is a 2014 film, obviously in anticipation of Godzilla vs. Kong. And then a film that I'm probably going to buy in 4K is the upgraded and improved Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice. Matt, oh my it includes God, corrected color grading, so it's a little brighter and more vibrant. Mm -hmm. And it actually includes the IMAX aspect ratios. The original release did not have those. So when the IMAX scene hits, it will take up your full screen instead of staying in the uh, widescreen version. And it will also be available, though, on HBO Max on March 18th to coincide with the release of the Zack Snyder cut of Justice League. And there's no theatrical cut included in this set. It looks like it's just the ultimate edition of BVS. Okay. If I can get it for like 10, 15 bucks... I'll probably pull the trigger, but that would be it. <laughs> Though I do have HBO Max, so I guess what's the point? Yeah, exactly. You, you can watch it whenever you want. There you are. Your straight-to-DVD pick of the week is Cosmo Ball. It's 2071, Matt. Galactic wars have destroyed the moon and changed the climate on Earth. Now tropical forests are covering Moscow while New York is iced all over. A huge alien ship towers over Moscow. It is a stadium where spectacular intergalactic Cosmo Ball competitions take place. The game combines both sport and gladiator fights. When the game is on, the whole world stops its tracks and watches it. The players are called athletes. That's good. Only they are allowed to contest because of their powers. Only they are what? Are allowed to contest because their powers and ability to control them. Oh, let's try that again. Only they are allowed to contest because their powers and ability to control them. Nope, makes no sense. Everyone adores Cosmo Ball except Anton. A regular guy who wants to find a job to help his family. But once he reveals his powers and gets to the world's Cosmo Ball team, now he's one of the athletes. Anton has no idea what special role is destined for him, Matt, and that the final game will become the battle for Earth itself. Wow. What should we be streaming this week? So I'm going to recommend some light, um, quick viewing. Um, Build as one of the all-time great war films is uh, Das Boot, which follows the um, a war correspondent from Germany uh, during World War II who has been embedded into the crew of a uh, German U-boat as he fights in the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, it is a very interesting, um, just beautifully shot, very technical take on um, warfare that just kind of really punctuates the long stretches of boredom with the few seconds of terror. That is the description of war in general. It's, it's, it's a classic. And if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. Although be, be aware it is like three hours long. So um, it's not, uh, it's not a quick view. Yeah. I have never seen that film. It's on my list. I got to get around to it at some point. Yeah. You'd love it. That's a U boat. All right, Matt. I know I've made that joke before, <laughs> so we'll keep moving. <laughs> Let's spend some time and discuss the final film in our trilogy of monster movies this week, Love and Monsters. This is 7045, come in 3022. I repeat, come in 3022, over. This is 3022, what is it now, Ray? Hey, Janice, no, it's actually, it's uh, Joel. Oh, Joel. Yeah. All right, hold on one second. Amy, it's Ray. It's Joel. Thanks, Janice. Joel, hey. Hey, Amy. Hi. How Hi. are you? Yeah, I, I'm good. It's so good to hear your voice. I'm so sorry. I heard on the open frequency that one of you guys got killed. Yeah, breached the bunker. Wow, 
actually got inside? Yeah, it's the first time it's happened. It's kind of scary. Did you have to fight it too? Yeah. Yeah, a little. I had to fight it a little bit. I actually got super ripped since last time you saw me, so... Oh, wow. <laughs> super ripped, Yeah, huh? I was kidding. I'm not super ripped. <laughs> that was just a bad joke. Well, I'm glad you're okay. I'm glad too. Matt, why don't you tell the fine folks at home, what is love and monsters all about? The Earth is threatened by a giant uh, asteroid, and the solution is to send up all of the rockets in the world and blow it up, which succeeds. But all of the debris running down from space and the radiation associated with those uh, nuclear weapons mutates all of the um, lizards and insects into massive man-eating monsters that quickly take over and kill everyone. There's a few pockets of survivors um, living in quote-unquote colonies underground, and our main character decides that he is going to go and brave the surface to get to his girlfriend who he has not seen in seven years at another colony, you know, seven days away. And that's what it's, it's, it's about his trek to get to, to true love. Oh, that's sweet. Really? <laughs> it is. Would you wait six or seven years to do that personally? If, if you're going to pull that trigger, I don't know. Well, from what I understand, um, he had been calling around to various colonies trying to find her and he had just found her. Um, at the beginning of the movie, like, you know, a few days prior. That's right. I'd mm -hmm. forgotten that already. But don't mm -hmm. take that as an indictment on the film, Matt. Because for me, I think this was possibly the best of all the films we watched this week. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I um, I really enjoyed this. It has a, a bit of a... It kind of reminded me of Warm Bodies a little bit. The Nicholas Holt's uh, blonde... Uh, blonde Kristen Stewart film and I don't know the actress's name just every time I see her I always think it's Kristen Stewart with a blonde wig on but uh, it's essentially that kind of feel to it it's it's love in the time of of the apocalypse and it's got a kind of a lighthearted tone coupled with this uh you know fearful death at every turn uh society which I think is overall you know a good melt a, a good melding and I think they were pretty successful in pulling it off Absolutely. I think that one of the reasons why this film is so successful is that, our, well, let's put it this way. Remember we, we talked last week about Greenland and why that film worked as well as it did? It's the mm -hmm. emotional connection, right? You care about these characters. And Dylan O'Brien and Jessica uh, Henwick, they're, they're our couple, our estranged, our separated couple, right? And he's on his way to see her. And that's what makes it work is that you feel for these people. And it's also very well done. Right, they they're able to balance the emotions with the horror, the lightheartedness at times, which is a nice little escape from the scares. And I got to tell you, I really appreciated the monster designs in this film. It, it's reminiscent of uh, Peter Jackson's King Kong when they go to Skull Island, which is mm -hmm. still, I think, the best part of that entire film. And right. it's, it's the gigantic bugs and this oh. Really just great creature effects on this thing. But it's the emotional through line that provides the authenticity and sweetness, I think, that propels the film along and makes it really engaging. It's not just the great effects. It's not just, at times, the great jokes. It's not just the, show, the appearance of Michael Rooker, who shows up and is a blast mm -hmm. in this thing as well. And uh, it's good. Maybe for me, Matt, the, myologues, the dialogue excuse me, is a little too quippy at times. But for the most part, uh, I enjoyed the hell out of this thing. And let me tell you, this is how you set up a sequel, right? I'm looking at you, Monster Hunter. I want to <laughs> see more of this world as our crew, or our people, our survivors kind of take their next step. Uh, that's something I'd be interested in seeing. Not so much uh, the other film that we talked about earlier today. That would, I'd be up for a Psycho Goreman sequel too, if I'm being perfectly mm. honest. There you go. But it, Matt, it's an adventure with thrills, scares, laughs, and true love. What more can you? What ask more for? do you need? Exactly. What more do you need? Do you have anything else to add on that? I would say too. I'm curious. This was supposed to get a theatrical release, mm -hmm. but the uh, COVID basically forced Paramount to pocket it, and eventually just gave it a digital release, which right. I think is a shame because I think this thing it may is. have done reasonably well and have got a garnered at least a, a much larger audience than just the people who are caught up with it at home. Yeah, I agree. I think this is one of those rare films that it's actually. 
you know, not based on an existing property. It's not a sequel. Um, it's kind of an original, relatively small budget film um, that works pretty well. And it's a shame that it's going to kind of be a footnote um, in the Rona experience as far as cinema goes. I don't think anybody's going to necessarily remember it, but maybe I'm wrong. And maybe with any luck, it'll become a bit of a cult classic, which um, I could see it doing. Yeah, I think there's definitely opportunity for that here. There's an, All those elements are here. Like not really seen, actually really good, some great scares. And yeah, no, this has a good opportunity to catch on uh, later on. And I, I hope it does. I really mm -hmm. do, Matt. I, I ended up giving Love and Monsters a B plus. Me too. Wow. Right on the nose. So that's fun. So I got B for me, B minus, C mm -hmm. for you, C minus, mm -hmm. and then B plus, B plus. So we are at the end of the episode, we are perfectly balanced. We are, as all things should be. <laughs> the yin and the yang of film criticism is here, folks, at the first run. Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. right, Matt. If you had a chance to see Love and Monsters, which is available on physical copies and to rent everywhere now, shoot us an email at feedback at the first run dot com. Oscars, Matt. Oscars, Oscars, Oscars. Let's spend a few minutes and kind of share our thoughts on the recently announced nominations. And just listen to this. Just I'm just playing a part of this. Matt can see I have my Super Yaki t-shirt on right now that reads, Nominate Del Lori Lindo, you cowards. And uh, just bask in this and just get angry like I do. Am I as weak? I got no intestinal fortitude. And strong as Paul. No, no, sir. We got the guts Paul got. They ain't they fault. They was born weak. Otis and his hoe caught these gutter snipes, chain snatches. They ain't snatching the gold bars. Not Paul. No, sir. I ain't getting fucked again. Try to fuck me with the salt and the Vaseline. Yeah. Not Paul. Not this time. Son of bitches. Son of bitches. Turn my own son against me. My own blood. God damn. Well. We don't see you standing in the end. Well, unfortunately, Delroy Lindo was standing on his own at the end. Matt, for me, I think the biggest snub of these 2021 Oscars, Delroy Lindo's Paul from The Five Bloods. Just a monster performance. That scene particularly, which goes on for like another minute and a half as he's broken from his group and he's moving forward. And he's doing this monologue directly at the camera, directly to us. But his, just as I said, a powerhouse performance. And I am just sorely disappointed in the Academy. Now, there is some good news out of this and some confusion as well. All we can say, at least we can say that Jared Leto did not get a nomination, right? <laughs> he did not, no. And, and let's just, I think, why don't we talk about this? Act in the supporting role. Because I think that is the, the, most talked about announcement for a lot of reasons. First okay. off, I'd say Paul Racy getting a nomination for Sound of Metal is well deserved, and I'm happy to see it. Mm -hmm. Again, we I just briefly we mentioned Delroy Lindo being robbed. What are your thoughts? Do you think Lindo is, um, is it just me as part of the Lindo hive here, or are you on board with me? No, I'm on board with it. I mean, I think um, I think he definitely deserved to have a nomination, although just by the very fact that you have T-shirts printed um, and that people have been talking about the fact that he was not going to get nominated, even though he deserved to be nominated since the since basically the film came out. It's a little odd to me because I don't know why anybody's really surprised if everybody was that sure that he would. I mean, who would you have taken out? Leslie Odom mm -hmm. Jr. in One Night in Miami. Yeah, OK. Over I, Sasha I, Baron Cohen. Uh, probably. I would probably remove Sasha Baron Cohen as well. And we, okay. and then we'll talk about it in a second. Caillou and Stanfield, which I think is another right. bizarre thing. It is. Out of Paul yeah, Racy, I mean, the only other lock for me 
is is Del Rio Lindo. And the rest of them okay. we can talk about. Because mm-hmm. the problem with Caillou and Stanfield is what does that role mean? And it is Clemens the lead in that film? Is yeah, that I was going to say, yeah, I don't. That's really weird. Like Lakeith Stanfield, like I could see a case made for Daniel Kaluuya to being a a supporting actor in this because he's not as he's a presence, but he's not as in much of the film. But Lakeith Stanfield is obviously the lead, so that's really odd to me that he would be nominated as this, in a supporting role for this. Well, I'll say, I don't know. So one of our friends on Twitter, there, Danielle Solzman, she wrote, and I think it's actually on Vox, and I linked to it in our mm. Twitter account. So if you go to our Twitter account, you'll see I I, I retweeted it. The article she wrote was really interesting. I think it makes sense to me, though it's infuriating. Okay. Is the problem okay. is is the Oscar voters looked at the roles and basically it's kind of like, you know, the the MVP vote in baseball or everybody you, you, mm-hmm. you root for you get like rounds or at least you assign like I well I think I think some of them say that that Stanfield's is supporting, other ones say that Caillou is supporting, and then some say mm-hmm. Caillou is the lead and some say Stanfield's the lead. And you can mm-hmm. what happens then? And if you don't get a number enough votes, you drop down to the other category that you have votes gotcha. in. So if he has gotcha. more votes for supporting, that's where he ends up. Gotcha. Now the argument for making Caillou with a lead is typically in these films when you have an historical figure who the film is really revolving around, like all mm-hmm. the events. He's the you know he's the one the film is about basically right, right? and Stanfield right. is the one instigating the events about. Yeah. Uh, Caillou's character so that's sometimes why you'll see that in the lead but I agree with you that I think Stanfield technically would be the lead because the film mm-hmm. is about his story and his journey and the things that he do that he does right Caillou is the bigger role because he's playing the more famous person right so I would I say agree. Stanfield should be lead and then Caillou uh, I would want him lead as well so I think the performance is that impressive but I understand if he ends up in a supporting role I but I can't yeah. I can't justify the Stanfield one yeah, neither can I. I mean, I think obviously just with the very coda of that film where they have a a, um, a segment of the of an interview with the real person that Stanfield is playing would argue to me that it's really his film, that it's that historical figure, not the kind of broader, more important historical figure that they're talking about. But at the same time, I mean, you know, I'm looking at the actor roles. Who would you – I haven't seen – the father i don't know if you have no so i can't comment on that interesting chadwick boseman as the lead and in, in, as a lead actor in ma rainey's what do you think about that do you think that's a fitting role to be a lead now granted i can't necessarily think of who else would be the lead actor but i mean i would think that the true lead actor would have been viola davis in that i almost feel like boseman would have been a supporting role as well yeah, I think if if the awards were genderless, basically, mm-hmm. or should I say sexless, they would be. I would think it would be uh, entirely Viola Davis's role, and then, I mean, how do you say? I, I really think Bozeman is the standout of the ensemble of the rest of the musicians, right? Right. So, right. I think partly too, it's likely due to his passing. Hmm. I mean, the performance oh, is is great, but and I think it may have ended up nominated. But is it a lead role? I don't, I don't think so. No, right? Yeah, I agree. I think you could flip around a little bit, and it's strange. Like I don't know that much about how the Academy comes up with its its uh, nominations, but if it's kind of like a ranked voting kind of thing, then I guess there's not a whole lot you can do about it. I mean, and obviously it's way too late now because it's not like they can go back and flip stuff around. So if they were going to, if there was going to be some kind of divine intervention, you know, beforehand by a committee of some kind, that time is long since passed. But if it is just kind of like a straight ranked voting thing, I guess it is what it is. So I don't think it's a ranked voting thing. It's more, it's, and if I said, that's how I put it away. I apologize. It's more like 10 voters would vote for Bozeman in a, in a leading role. Five would Mm -hmm. vote for supporting. Mm-hmm. Five different ones are vote for supporting, right? And if mm-hmm. he doesn't have enough, they didn't have enough to crack the top five. So mm-hmm. say like, you know, Oldman got 30, Yoon got 40, right? His mm-hmm. votes aren't enough that he drops out, but he's still in contention for supporting, right? If he has more votes than other people in the supporting role. And that's how it kind right. of comes into play. Seems very strange. Yeah. It's it's how those, those vo- actor voting public, those people how they interpret what the role is and then what mm-hmm. they vote for them in. It's a little complicated, obviously. 
So, but yeah, no, we, I haven't seen The Father, Pieces of a Woman, or Another Round, which is the Mads mm-hmm. Mikkelsen film, which is all supposed to be good. So I will remedy right. that prior to the Oscars. I know we have, as the Studio Ghibli uh, marathon is coming up, but yeah, I is. will fit those in at some point beforehand. So what about Paul Racy? Huh? That's great that he got a nomination. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Good for him. I'm, I'm very happy that he got a nomination or somebody else. I like that Riz Ahmed got a got a nomination for lead actor. I think that's well deserved. Steven Yoon, I think, is well re- deserved as well. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting slate of 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 nominees, and I think that's it's basically because of the year that we had. I'm honestly not that surprised by any of it, to be quite honest with you. I mean, and, and we've seen eighty percent of these films. I hesitate that trial of the chicago seven really got anything yeah. um, and i'm very surprised that it got nominated for best picture but at the same time yeah. it was just an exceptionally weak year just because of the pandemic and everything else going on so i don't know i personally would not have put include that in the running in probably many different uh categories but it is what it is i guess it's there so there's never underestimate the hokiness of the old academy voter well, yeah. So I think Charles Chicago Seven should easily swap that with, uh, with at least first cow. I think should mm. be in that slot. I and, agree. But I would say that Mank leads the field, Matt, with ten, nom- 10 nominations, mm-hmm. and we know how much Hollywood loves hearing about itself. So is that yep. the odds-on favorite at this point? Yeah, maybe. But I almost feel like Nomadland is is the one to is going to get a lot of the larger awards just based off of the kind of year-long buzz that this thing has had about how it's the best thing around so i'm I'm really hopeful um i think there's a lot of you know deserving um films in there i i don't think that um mank is one of them per- personally out of most of those i wouldn't be angry if you know five out of of them you know won. although i think it's nomad's race to lose i agree i think nomad nomad land is the odds on favorite right now Mm-hmm. But um, there's, they said we haven't seen the father, so I'm clearly we're going to remedy that one prior to. But right. there's a lot of great stuff this year, as long as we ignore trial of the Chicago Seven. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that first cow erasure? Nothing. Yeah, I think that just it suffers from the fact that it was released early in the year. I think um, if you release a, like an artistic or awardsy type film that's deserving of it. If you do that in the beginning of the year, it's basically it's gonna get it's gonna get overshadowed by things that come lately. And honestly, you know, one of the big complaints I have at the Oscars is that it always seems to be recency bias. I mean, the stuff that gets a real push for the most part doesn't come out until the very end of the year. So yeah. I think it's just a it's just it's just a victim of timing. Um, it's unfortunate because it's a great film, but I uh, yeah I think if they had released it in the fall, um, I think it would have done a lot better. What about Rada Blank? I was hoping she was it was my dark horse to get an act to a, a nomination actress in a leading role. I'm honestly, I again, I'm not surprised. I didn't particularly love that film. You know, I'm in the minority here, and I can't speak to. Weirdly enough, looking at actress in a leading role, I think that's uh, got the most that I haven't seen in so far as the United States. I haven't seen the United States versus Billie Holiday, which is brand new, or Pieces of a Woman. So I, I can't comment on either of those roles. Mm-hmm. But I think. Of the three that I have seen, I can't see that Rada Blank would replace either of those. She doesn't even come close to Viola Davis, Francis McDormand, or Carrie Mulligan. So um, I in, I can't say without reserving judgment to see how Andrew Day or Vanessa Kirby do. In From what film. I understand, yeah, the United States versus Billie Holiday is a training day scenario where well, the film is, is not it? good, but she's right. supposed to be very, very good in it. Okay. And I, my, obviously, you could probably guess that I'm pulling for Carrie Mulligan and Promising Young Woman. They, <laughs> yeah, I don't think that I don't think she wins. I think it's going to no. be Frances McDormand for no, sure. You're, you're probably right. What about actress Maria Bakalova? Huh? Or supporting? For I what? should say supporting oh, supporting role. actress. Um, let me see which one is that. Uh, oh, and in, in Borat's subsequent movie film, I'm I'm happy for. Her. I don't think she'll win, but I, I think I'm happy for. Her. But again. Looking at this, I, I haven't seen Hillbilly Elegy. I haven't seen The Father, although I'm a big fan of Olivia Coleman. I think she's great. Honestly, though, if there's any justice in the world, uh, Yoon Young 
Young Yoon Yu Young would be the one that would win for me because she was fantastic as the grandmother of Minari. Yeah, same. I haven't seen Hillbilly Elegy or Father. And again, we'll rectify those. But right now, for me, I want Yoon Yu Young to win as well. She mm-hmm. was, as you said, great as the grandmother of Minari. Yeah, but I think, you know, Maria Bakalova for Borat, I think that's a well-deserved nomination. I thought she was the, the best part of the film, really. Yeah, indeed. How do you feel about there being only the eight nominations for Best Picture? You can go up to ten. Uh, yeah, then I guess, you know, maybe then maybe there's no excuse to put First Cow in there. Um, you know, I definitely think that should have got in there. I, what else would – I honestly would have thrown Soul in there, you cowards. Um, you know, I, I mean, if you got ten and you've got uh, another open spot, I definitely would have thrown that in there. Um, Not Possessor? <laughs> no, not Possessor. Um, although, I mean, do you think the Five Bloods should have been there? The, the, the Five Bloods should have been in there as well? I don't think so. I think no. it's good, but it's. Yeah. I didn't enjoy it as much as the Black Klansman, which I had to think definitely should have been. I think it was, too. Was yeah, I think it was. But then I think that may just be my own internal, you know, ignorance and bias. Because while sure. Black Klansman is a black film, but around kind of a white perspective the five bloods mm-hmm. is an entirely black perspective film so maybe there's just something in there that i don't catch or appreciate as right. much as i did the other one right well i mean so besides first cow what would you what else would you have thrown in there for those for the 10th film you know i don't know i mean outside of that it's i think for the most part that's pretty good again not having seen the father mm-hmm. but i'm not sure what else that's out there that we saw that I don't know. What do you, do you have anything that you would have thrown in there? I mean, I would have put soul in there. I mean, like I said, I yeah. don't think it would have sort of chance in hell of winning, but I think it deserved, it would have deserved to be nominated for sure. And are we sure that first cow came out this year? Was it like a, wasn't like a 2019 film that kind of just snuck into 2020. Oh I yeah. Know. See first cow was a 2019 film. Well then why wasn't According it nominated the year TV. before that? <laughs> I, I don't know that I can't say, but, um, Maybe, yeah, I don't know. Um, no, what else is not in there? That what? should definitely be in there. Never, rarely, sometimes, always. That was a 2020 film. Yes, that would be the other one. Thank yeah. you. That's the other one that definitely should be in there. No Palm Springs for you either there, huh? Um. So, I mean, if we're talking First Cow, Soul, and Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always, a jettisoning Trial of Chicago 7, I think that's I think that's right. Um, Palm Spring, as much as I liked it, I enjoyed Palm Spring a lot. I, If you're going to have the populist pick, I'd still think you have to go with Soul, personally. Yeah, I would do Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always. And if I am stuck with 8, I would obviously take out Trial of Chicago 7. I, I would take out Mank as well. Hmm. I think that's a better film than Mank. Um, and if I had to, maybe Sound of Metal. I really, I think it's it's even better than that. Really? Okay. So that's man. I forgot about. Gee, you're entirely right. Never, really, sometimes, always. I would even consider uh, what's her name now. I'm blanking. I apologize for her for a nomination as well. I thought she was fantastic in that thing. And uh, not a lot of love for that film at all. I think that's another Sidney Flanagan. That's the other big mix then for me. The other big snub would be, the yeah, look at me. I didn't have it either though, so I'm just as guilty <laughs> of that erasure. But the uh, Never Really Sometimes Always was, well, I think it was like my number three, something like that of the yeah. year. So yeah, yeah, that's disappointing. Mm-hmm. Stupid, yeah. stupid heads. It didn't, uh, yeah, it didn't get a nomination for a single thing. Although, as usual, I'm interested in seeing some of these documentary features. I know Crip Camp is, is out there on streaming right now, so I should I would do want to catch that and see mm-hmm. what some of these other ones are to, to watch. What about uh, animated feature? Do you have any thoughts on that? Onward, Over the Moon, a Shaun the Sheep movie for Armageddon, Soul, and Wolf Walkers. Is it just Soul walking away for you? <clears throat> I, think, I think so. I think... Um... Wolf Walkers is great, and I I really enjoyed Onward. I know I'm you know in the minority on that one, even on this show. I haven't seen the other two, but I think Soul is just it was my number one film of the year. I loved it. I I definitely think that's a, an easy layup win. Tenet got a couple technical nominations, as mm-hmm. did uh, our Eleven Monsters. You got a visual oh, effects nod. So. I saw that. Yeah, yeah, good for them. There you go. Yeah, I'll be interested to do our predictions. I mean, though we've done a lot of predicting so far on this, I, you know, our solid take it to the bank predictions. 
I, and I'm really looking forward to talking about directing. I think that's a very interesting category. No, that is. So we got another round, which we will be catching up with. Mank, Minari, No Man Like Promising Young Woman. That is interesting. And uh, what about the, interesting too that all the play adaptations were shut out of Best Picture. <clears throat> Ma Rainey's mm. Black Bottom, Pieces of a Woman, One Night in Miami, and The Father were all adaptations of stage plays. None of them got Best Picture. Good. Good, I say. <laughs> <laughs> Stop doing it. Damn it. Stop subjecting to me such things. I could make an argument for Ma Rainey's in the Best Picture race as well. Mm. So Yeah. Again, Trial of Chicago 7 got in there somehow, and you still got more. You still got a couple slots, even if you leave that one in there. So, you know, um, yeah. fine. They should have just filled it out. Yeah. Man, I'm now I'm all upset about Never Rarely, Sometimes, Always. Part of me is upset you brought it up because mm -hmm. the the pain I feel inside. But I'm glad <laughs> you reminded me because I would have felt even dumber afterwards for not uh, remembering to discuss it or bring it up. All right, so we have to we have to ignore first cow because that was 2019, but now we get to stand for for Is never it, I still sometimes always. I can't be right. Uh, according on. to IMDb, yeah, but what does that mean? Where? Telluride. It, it showed at a film festival. Telluride didn't get a mass release here until March 6 of 2020. Yeah, but doesn't that still count for purposes of of the Academy voting? <sighs> I don't know. Should I mean, I don't know how strict it is, you know? I mean, it's in all the 2020 award categories. Mm -hmm. Boston Society of Film Critics, New York Film Critics, Burl International, I'm, Chicago, Florida. I'm, I personally, I'm all for it. You know, I, it's all 2020. I, I you know, love that film. Um, you know, some other ones that we liked that didn't get a lot of love. I mean, Dick Johnson is Dead didn't get, a, get any love from the documentary category. Um the assistant. I don't know if you would uh, uh, nominate anyone for that. Maybe you know, um, best actress, or maybe yeah. I would say have to be lead actress for Julia Garner. Could be thrown in there. I don't know. There's 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 always something that you could argue yeah. incessantly about what what's correct in this. You know, that's true. That is true. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to as you said our our uh, picks. So that'll be a fun episode. Caillou or Stanfield is going to be tough for me. Oh. Yeah, I think that's just going to be one of those ones that I'm going to have to go with my heart, whether regardless of whether I think it's wrong or not. I'm not going to go Vegas odds. I know Chris likes to win, but I think I'm just going to go <laughs> who I think should win. I sort of got if it's if it's Baron Cohen for Charles Chicago Seven, I will burn this place <laughs> to the ground. Not that he was bad at it. It's just though so it's he's it's not as good as everybody of, else nominated. No, absolutely not. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, it'll be it'll be Leslie Odom. That's what it'll be. Possibly. I don't know. I like Paul Racy, but we'll see. Yeah. Or I'm I'm gonna figure out a way in some one of these categories. I'm still gonna call Del Rio Lindo. Maybe somebody will swoop in at the last minute. <laughs> it'll be a, a a Kanye thing. We'll, we'll right. You know, he did it. I'm gonna let Swift. you finish. I'm gonna let you finish, Lakeith. <laughs> but uh, but Delroy Lindo. <laughs> Good times. Anything to add? You ready to wrap it up? No, yeah, I'm ready to wrap it up. I'm I'm good. All right. What are we doing next week? That's a great question. Do you have any idea? Because I don't. Let's see. What is it? Uh, it is. Oh, you know what we're doing? Four oh. hours, baby. Uh, 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 uh. We're doing the be... dig and cherry. Is what no, we we're have. not. Oh, we're not. No, we're oh, we're doing. <laughs> Are we doing? Are we doing the the Snyder Cut? Of course we are. Oh, How could geez, we not? I'm, I'm so excited for that. Why don't so we, excited. Why don't we make it to like a um? Let's make it just a big DC extravaganza. All okay. right. We can do a recap of the entire DC EU with the films, but when we'll discuss Snyder Cut, it's just four hours long. You what? We could just make it that one, or do you want to try and throw in something? No, else? that's that's fine. I feel like I'm going to be angry enough to, to fill up the whole show on this. Okay. <laughs> so there it is. How did I forget? Oh it's boy! Snyder cut time, baby. After all this time, all these years. Super excited! So excited! I got to see if I can figure out a way to show this at the theater here in St. Pete. If he can stream. <laughs> Are you still talking about that? I might. I might. All right. I might, Rabbit. Well, good I luck might. to you. All right. In the meantime, uh, catch up with us at thefirstrun.com, Facebook, YouTube, 
Twitter, Instagram, do a search for the first run, scroll, scroll, scroll. Eventually you will find us and head on over to Apple Podcasts. Give us a review. It'll help other people find the show and we will read it on there. And I still can't believe I forgot about Never Rarely Sometimes Always. Jesus, what is wrong with me? Okay. See you next week. (laughs) Snyder Cut, baby. Yeah. We'll see if all that toxic fandom was worth it. Take care of yourselves, folks. Brought you some reading material, PG. And a TV to watch. Did you sleep okay? I'm sorry we didn't bring any pornos. Petty displays of wealth. How can your short lifespans allow such narcissism? Yeah, but look at all the hunky boys. I do not care for hunky boys.